Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Mark Demaz, a thought leading writer and recognized champion of the multi ethnic church movement. Mark planted the Mosaic Church of Central Arkansas in 2001, where he continues to serve as directional leader. In 2004, he co-founded the Mosaics Global Network with Dr. George Yancey, today serving as its president and convener of the Triennial National Multi-Ethnic Church Conference. In 2008, he launched Vine and Village and remains active on the board of his 501c3 nonprofit, focused on spiritual, social, and financial transformation of Little Rock's University District. In 2019, Mark launched an academic partnership with Wheaton College, and he is an adjunct professor at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and Phoenix Seminary, where he earned a demon in 2007. Mark has written seven books, including what we'll be talking about today, The Coming Revolution in Church Economics, in 2019, he and his wife, Linda, have been married for 32 years and reside in Little Rock, Arkansas. Mark and Linda have four adult children and three grandchildren. Let's welcome Mark to the show. All right, welcome to the show, Mark. Is there anything else you'd like our listeners to know about you? No, Lauren, great to be with you today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. For our listeners, uh, my daughter is home from school. You'll probably hear perhaps a little bit grunting and moaning perhaps and cheering. She's doing some math prodigy computers fun stuff while she has her assessment at, at school in a little bit. So uh, appreciate your understanding there. Well, Mark, tell our listeners, if you would, just about your journey of faith, what it looked like you coming to faith and, and what that looks like today. Yeah, again, great being with you today, Lauren. You know, I was born out of wedlock, 1961, raised in a single parent home uh, with my mother uh, in San Francisco, California. Uh, she raised me Catholic, uh, and uh, in terms of my faith journey, uh, but I'm also very blue collar. I mean, my mother to support us, as you can imagine, in 1961, uh, I think it was about 6% of American children were born into homes without a father. I was one of those. So she was gigging before gigging was cool. You know, she was, she was, uh, doing all that and I was doing it with her. So she had a full-time job with the government during the day. We'd sell Avon on the streets at night. Uh, I'd go with her. We had a five-block territory. That started at age seven. So uh, I've been working hard all my life, just turned 60 in November. So a little bit of my personal background there. But again, she raised me Catholic. We moved to Phoenix, Arizona when I was starting sixth grade. And, uh, and that's where I was educated in Catholic schools and also by the Jesuits through high school. I was a baseball player. Uh, and had a walk-on, uh, invited walk-on at a junior college in, in, in uh, Mesa, Arizona, played for a year. And during that year, met a couple of Christians on this otherwise uh, just community college team, was impressed by that, had begun attending a church close uh, to that school where for the first time I really made the connection from what I knew in my head about God to wanting Christ to be in my heart and to walk with him. So I became a believer uh, uh, Christ follower there uh, at 19 years of age, uh, 1980, the summer of 1980, just before my sophomore year in college. And uh, after fall ball that year, I got a full ride scholarship to Liberty University. So uh, Liberty was just 10 years old at the time, about 2,500 students. We were playing Division I uh, scheduling. And so uh, I went right into the starting lineup, finished three years there. And that's to say, in terms of the faith journey, I went from Jesuit Catholicism to independent fundamentalist Baptist <laughs> indoctrination overnight, if you will. Uh, but a wonderful time there uh, at Liberty. It was a, a great school at the time to attend. Uh, so glad for the formation of my coaches there, uh, all that we learned. And on top of that, I feel like I was discipled by Keith Green. That's where I first heard his music and really felt like his passion was seeded into me. So uh, I was too slow to get drafted three years later. And um and having said that, I had nothing better to do. I was a psych major, a church in Scottsdale, the one I had mentioned earlier, which was a conservative Baptist church, 
invited me to be their high school pastor. I had no idea what that meant, but I had nothing better to do. Took that job for $400 a month, living at home with my mom. And a uh, year and a half into it, uh, the pastor came to me and he said, uh, it seems that uh, the kids really respond to you well and, and they like you. And I go, yeah, it seems they do. And he says, and it seems like you really like doing this. It seems like you're a natural. I said, well, I guess I am. I certainly enjoy it. And uh, he said, you want to keep doing this? And I said, yeah. He said, well, if you want to keep doing this, you can't keep giving your testimony every month or every week. And I, because every week, because I had nothing better than my story, right? I'd never studied the Bible. And so having said that, uh, I ended up going to seminary at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon, uh, and met my wife, Linda, there uh, 1985 to 87, and got right involved again as a youth pastor in a church. We would later go to Germany for a couple of years. To make a long story short, 10 years in student ministries when I was hired here in Little Rock by a large church in 1993. At the time, 2,000 people. Eight years later, it was 5,000. That youth group of 7th through 12th graders went from uh, 150 to 600. My staff from one assistant to nine full-time. We built a $3.5 million student center. I was in the top two paid percent of youth pastors in America. I'm living the dream. Everything's awesome until one day in the late 90s, I looked around this otherwise amazing church and realized the only people of color there essentially were janitors. Mm. And that began to bother me, but I didn't know in 1997 why that bothered me, but it began to bother me. And so over the next few years, in spite of doing student ministry and continuing in that church, I uh, had a master's in exegesis at the time, uh, exegetical theology. And so I began to just study for myself the New Testament church, the nature of the New Testament church. I threw out my seminary notes, so to speak, in the commentaries and just read my own homework I had been taught that the way to plant, grow, and develop churches was to target a people group. That's called the homogeneous unit principle. I had been taught that the New Testament churches were segregated. That is, Jewish believers going to uh, churches filled with Jewish believers, Gentiles, others. Were, were, was it true? Were these concepts true and biblical? I determined that they weren't, and I realized that every church in the New Testament outside of Jerusalem was what we would call today a healthy, multi-ethnic, uh, economically diverse church. Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, men and women— as we say here in Little Rock at Mosaic, walking, working, and worshiping God together as one. With that in mind then, in 2001, I left that 18-year career in student ministries, the final eight here at a mega church in the suburbs, and came to the inner city of Little Rock, 66% of kids without dads in the home at the time, 30% uh, 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 crime, highest violent crime in the city, 30% of homes at or below poverty. Uh, to chase what Christianity Today would call three years later a big dream in Little Rock could, in fact, diverse men and women will themselves again to walk, work, worship God together as one. And Lauren, we're coming up three months from now on our 20th birthday. Uh, hard to believe that it's gone that long. Hard to believe that we've made it, so to speak. And uh, we just are centered on that verse as we have been from the beginning. First Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he who calls you that he will do it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that scripture. Well, thanks for sharing that, Mark. Uh, I'm curious. What are some spiritual practices that have been meaningful for you or you might recommend to others? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll share those um, or share this with you, Lauren, and your listeners. Uh, like a good uh, preacher, I suppose, I'm going to alliterate four words for you, right? Yeah. Passion, prayer, patience, and persistence. Yeah. Passion is uh, rooted in a, uh, a deep search for calling and a connection with God to find it for yourself. Mm hmm so passion is the beginning of everything. That's my time with God. That's my search with God for what it is you would have me to do uh, at a macro level, at sea level, uh, you know, 20, 21 years ago to establish this church on a daily basis. But connecting again with God, finding my passion and my calling, uh, passion is rooting and calling my experience with God, my search, my discovery of what it is he has for me to do at a macro level in a season of my life. Uh, and uh, as well from day to day. That passion then drives you to prayer, right? Because we are, have to embrace dependence, certainly in this kind of work in the inner city, uh, to create a healthy, multi-ethnic, economically diverse church, to do the work of justice, compassion, and mercy in a, uh, in a, in a synergistic and an effective way, uh, to be culturally intelligent, to be financially sustainable, these types of things, uh, these kinds only come out through prayer and fasting. So rooted in my passion, which comes from my experience with God, I then begin with prayer. 
But then in terms of getting beyond that, I take intentional steps. And those are the steps that we take to chase that dream that I take to chase my own calling, our collective calling as a church, uh, beginning and rooted in prayer and passion, passion and prayer, but then uh, with intentionality, the exercise of patience and persistence, uh, learning to play the long game, for instance, uh, depending upon Christ and yet getting up every day and working as hard as I can to advance the kingdom of God and to do so, again, playing the long game with patience and persistence. In terms of church planting, I'll just say this for what it's worth, and I I, I believe that it really is about more than just church planting, but specific to church planting, uh, to, to establish these types of churches, certainly uh, we believe it takes about seven to 10 years to move from survival to stability, yeah, and another seven to 10 to go from stability to sustainability. So, uh, But those four P words, passion, prayer, patience, persistence, uh, those characterize our work and characterize my life over the past 20 something years. Yeah. Yeah, this is good stuff. Mark, I, I don't know if you remember, I was thinking back. I think it was was it last summer, two summers ago, you did a little uh, online seminar for my denomination, Christian Church Disciples of Christ, which I remember you mentioning some of this stuff and it was it was very helpful. So, I don't know if it's still a, available from New Church Ministry of the Disciples of Christ, but uh I'm sure you have plenty of other resources out there for folks who want to connect more for church planning ideas. Yeah, for sure. Uh, And of course we do that through Mosaics Global Network, mosaics, M-O-S-A-I-X dot info for anybody listening that might be interested in that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your book. So a few years back, Mark wrote a book with Harry Lee called The Coming Revolution in Church Economics, Why Ties Offerings Are No Longer Enough and What You Can Do About It. So first, I want to hear just kind of what brought about the book back then. Uh, Yeah, Lauren, actually, uh, that book codifies uh, things that we had been thinking about practicing literally for 15 years or more here in the inner city. But as I was just describing, I came from a church 21 years ago here in town, uh, you know, upper class, professional, wealthy white suburbs, if you will. And in that time and era in the 1990s and in that space, Uh, It's the old uh, adage, you know, money grew on trees. The more people that joined our church, we generated income. In fact, I remember sitting in one of the meetings where the elders of the church were planning the next year's budget, and they were literally calculating uh, an expected amount of growth next year, and based on every person, how much income that would bring to the church. Wow. That's the world that I was in. I very quickly realized when you plant, grow, or develop a uh, a church for all people in the inner city, the more people that cho- join your church, it actually cost you money. <laughs> it, it was completely upside down. Yeah. And uh, and so with that in mind, uh, we very quickly realized that tithes and offerings would not be enough yeah. to uh, not only get beyond survival to stability, but to sustainability. And particularly if we were going to be aggressive and effective at meeting the real needs of this community, uh, food insecurity, immigration issues, poverty, all those things were back there at that time as well, Uh, mentoring uh, young at-risk kids. If we were going to actually uh, be aggressive and intentional about effectively meeting those needs, again, tithes and offerings would not be enough. So we had a choice, essentially, I had a choice. Am I going to build a church for 75, 100 people, make my nice little paycheck off tithes and offerings, have an assistant, have a janitor, and go about my business? Or are we going to develop an effective work again, to really meet with intentionality uh, uh, the needs of this community. And of course, that's what we chose to do. And having said that, we realized we were going to have to develop multiple streams of income uh, and not simply rely on tithes and offerings. That's a starting point, but not certainly the stopping point. And, And that's what we went on to do. So over those years, we developed effective strategies, established a nonprofit to generate grants and donations later on, we're able to purchase our own building, and now we leverage that space to generate income as well and to advance our mission. So uh, what you hold in your hand now, published by Baker in 2019, is a book. Uh, and those ideas I first brought to the American church actually in an ebook for Leadership Network in 2012 uh, called Real Community Transformation, which then became a Thomas Nelson book called Disruption in 2017. And as part of that book, we broke out the section on economics and expanded it in the book the coming revolution in church economics. So this is not uh, mere theory. It's something we've been practicing for 20 years, uh, or certainly a good uh, 15 or so of that. 
And what we realized, and that's why we published the book, uh, is that what we have learned and experienced in the inner city over the years related to the funding sustainability of our church was not just isolated to inner city or urban churches. Today, it's for every church. Yep. Uh, with the steady decline of attendance, with the steady decline of offerings, with the rise of the nuns. Uh, and of course, we wrote this book prior to COVID. Just you know, for all these reasons, uh, demographic shifts, changing generational attitudes towards giving and finance. And then on top of that came COVID. So it's like what we realized was more like a maybe a 7 to 10 to 20 year uh, revolution is going to be compressed into about three to five, you know, because of COVID. So that's the backstory on the book. Well, highly recommend the, the book Disruption for our listeners, too. I have a copy of it here right in front of me uh, on my bookshelf. And I definitely appreciated the writing there. So again, you kind of you kind of mentioned this here. You wrote this book pre-COVID, and you said that tithes and offerings weren't enough. And I'm just thinking, wow, has that ever been magnified? I think post-COVID, uh, what are, are you seeing now that kind of just reinforces that, or some of the struggles you you encounter as you talk to pastors? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean. Uh like we're mentioning COVID just, you know, COVID people could look at the chart, so to speak. So prior to COVID, just in terms of, and we're spe specifically talking the local church, pastors, ministry leaders, denominational leaders, they clearly, uh, you know, read the charts, numbers, uh, you know, average attendance on, on the fall going down, uh, ties and, you know, offerings going down, um, aging population in their churches, uh, facility setting empty from week to week. All of that was known uh, mm -hmm. prior to COVID. And, 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 and basically people would get together and bemoan all that, but they didn't do anything about it. And in a sense, there was no sense of urgency. In a sense, there was, it would be nice for us to address this, but it's not necessary at the moment. And, and again, the old uh, adage of kicking the can down the road, right? Um, that somebody else will have to fix this down the road. But, you know, right now I'm, I'm paying my bills and I got my kids in college and, you know, whatever it was. So these things were known. You might even say it like this. Uh, it was known, but there was no felt need, right? Uh, there, was, there was knowledge that the need exists, but no real sense of urgency. And the lack of urgency then allowed people just to have, quote, conversations about this or to, in a sense, dream about this. What might it look like for a church to, to, to get beyond this? What, and that was kind of maybe the discussion. And, of course, there's always outliers like myself and others that are, you know, we, we, we don't have time to talk. We're getting after it. But then, of course, uh, given all that we knew uh, prior to COVID and then COVID, it, it's like, you know, it, it infuses the urgency because now I, I literally heard, like, I don't know how many churches, uh, you know, I hear different stats and read different people on that. But just like COVID as a disease, uh, as a virus, has killed people, right? So some people, you know, there's the healthy people, they say, and healthy people get the virus and they die. But many people have also died or struggled post-COVID because they were already struggling with one health issue or another. So, you know, that happens. Well, I'd say that's true for the church. Right. So churches, there are probably a good number of churches that were already struggling, that already had, quote, health issues, if you will. And COVID knocked them out of the park. Um, others, it revealed for other churches, it revealed that we knew we had a problem, but we didn't have a felt need or a sense of urgency. And that has risen exponentially. So now as we work with churches and, and, and all the, that we do through Mosaics, of course, there's that sense of urgency. And the, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a, a sense that we need to do things differently. So even if you're not uh, on your deathbed struggling to survive on, if you will, the urgency side, on the other side, it's it's the the urgency is there, but also the drive now, the motivation to realize there's a pre-COVID church and a post-COVID church, and we're never going back to pre-COVID ways. So for instance, I... Uh, I, I just give you a couple examples on that other side. So again, urgency because we're about to die. We got to fix this. Or on the other hand, a sense of urgency that we can't do things the way we've done. There's a smarter way to work. There's better stewardship. 
Uh, I'm uh, about to begin. Uh, I believe they they said it's all but done, but a signed contract, so to speak. But uh, in Georgia, there are five Methodist churches within a five mile square radius of one another. Uh, I've entered into conversation with conference leadership whereby they have asked me to help guide them. So these five churches actually become one church with five properties. And then how do we leverage those properties for spiritual, social, and financial advance and repurpose the four senior pastors leading these five churches uh, along with the varying staff to create one macro team? Uh, that's an innovative, disruptive innovation. I literally was called by uh Two nonprofits in Texas yesterday had a, a similar discussion, but they have two separate nonprofits. They're in a, a smaller town in Texas, and they're doing work, good work. Both nonprofits are doing good work with essentially the similar population, but one is more focused on children and youth, and one is more focused on adults. But they have two buildings. One's being rented. One is owned. They're separate entities right now, but they realize if we pool our resources— and we combine our efforts, we could create one stronger, more synergistic, more uh, sustainable work. And how do we do that? So those are a couple examples in real time of on this other side, if you're outright just not dying and you feel that urgency, on the other hand, you're recognizing we cannot do what we've done in the past. There's a better way and people are seeking out uh, how to do that. So. I want to ask you about a shift in mindset and you've kind of spoken to it already. So do you think it's just like a sense of urgency and a realization that things aren't the same? We can't just go back to the status quo. Is that it? Or do you think there's more even than that? No, I, I mean, I, I think it, it's certainly not like, well, you know, we can't go back to doing what the same is. It, but again, that's being said with a sense of urgency and with a sense of real uh, recognition. Because again, you know, prior to COVID, we could say, hey, we can't do things the way we've always done. I mean, who hasn't said that? Of course you can. We're not doing stuff in the 20th century we did in the 18th. So anybody knows that. But again, the drive, the urgency, the recognition, and the facts on the ground, so to speak, that are forcing that change, you know, that have forced it. Uh, just like prior to COVID, older people, you know, people might say, well, you know, I'm not on the internet. I don't. I don't go on almost like a sense of pride. I don't have Facebook. I don't do that. You know, I'm 70 years old and what do I got? COVID completely changed all that. If you're a 70 year old person in the church, I guarantee you're probably connected and your church helped you. Any thriving church, any healthy church would have helped you connected and you would have ran to that technology. Whereas two, three years ago, you avoided it. Um, churches that weren't, you know, just simple things like broadcasting their services. They figured out a way to do it. All right. So, the facts on the ground related to COVID forced that as well. Uh, and so all of that's to say, as I work with churches, you know, broadly speaking, there's three categories. There's the church again, that's on its deathbed. It's in, it's the, it's in the emergency room and they are looking for emergency room doctors to come in and can this thing be saved, right? That's one group. Then there's another group that uh, is in a sense um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're maintaining, but they realize if, and now there's that urgency, if we don't make a shift, we're dead. And then, of course, there's other churches that have used this moment to pivot and to, to ditch things intuitively and add things they weren't doing, and they're even better positioned coming out of COVID than they went into it. Yeah. You know, there's a Methodist pastor around here who I've spoken with. Um, I'll have to connect you because he's spoken to me about that kind of, he, he calls it the idea of a uh, central cathedral model, but the idea of combining churches together. And I, a lot of mainline churches have really resisted that, but I think there's a really good, just from basic principles of economy, uh, combining uh, resources to work together to, to strengthen and impact the communities. Um, one of my favorite lines in this book you have, and I think it's still relevant, is that you think churches need to stop begging for money. So why is that the case? Yeah, uh, you know, just kind of clickbait in the title of the chapter there, Stop Begging for Money. It has to do with this idea that we we have, it, it's been our experience, if you've been in the church, uh, if you lead churches, you're used to doing this. And apart from any challenging content or 
uh, you know, stretch fee, you know, free your mind kind of uh, exploration of other possibilities. The only way you get things done is to ask people to give. Mm -hmm. And so an entire industry in American church called generosity has been risen up. Mm -hmm. And, and that's just a lot more palatable a term than donate or get, let's be generous. But really, any pastor telling you to be generous, they're, they're saying, give me more money. Give the church more money. That, I mean, let's just be honest about it. Yeah, that. yeah. So it's couched in generosity. The problem is we've got an industry of generosity, but we don't know anything about stewardship. Because stewardship in the American church is management. Mm. But that is not biblical stewardship. Biblical stewardship is you gave me two, here's your two, and I made you two. Yeah, yeah. Here's your five, and you you know you gave me five, here's your five, and I made you five. One guy sat on his asset, and that guy was called a wicked, lazy steward. Yeah. So you have the, 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 the mindset is if we want to get something done, we're going to have to, quote, go beg for money. We're going to have to create a campaign. We're going to have to go through all that you do. And by the way, we just did, I, I lead two churches. We just did year-end giving, camp, you know, appeals, if you were not full-on campaigns, but appeals. Right. Uh, and in both churches raised about two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000, which is a lot of money in both those contexts. So I'm not against that at all. I, I just want to be really clear. But what I'm saying is there are other ways, and there, there must become other ways that we seek to generate uh, in, uh, sustainable income beyond the the donation side, beyond generosity. So in other words, if that's all you're doing, even think about a year in campaign, you might say to your folks, hey, we want to do this, this, this next year. It's going to cost this. Everybody give. Okay, they do that. Then the next year, hey, we need to do this. this. Okay, eventually, you know, smart people are going to go, man, every year you're asking, how are you, how are you spending the money and how are you leveraging these assets to generate income apart from the appeal? And so that's really what the chapter is about, is, is recognizing that, and, and really the whole concept, of course, that tithes and offerings are not enough. Sure, we're going to do year-end appeals. Sure, we're going to ask people to give. It is a part of biblical generosity. But at the same time, we have to exercise and learn what stewardship actually is, which is not management. Management's a part of stewardship, but it is not ultimately biblical stewardship as defined by Jesus. And once we realize God has given us assets in the form of people, in the form of money, in the form of facilities, right, uh, and then, then we leverage these assets, people, money, and facilities to essentially get even more. Now, I'm not talking necessarily, although that's a part of it, is generating more income, but our goal is not to get rich. I mean, we're not, you know, this isn't like capitalism in the church, like we're going to make all this money. No, what we're talking about, though, is leveraging assets to advance our mission, bless the community, of course, but at the same time, generating some measure of sustainable income. If people listening don't know what that is, sustainable income is something that is is replicated, is can repeat. If I own a if I own a house and I'm renting it, right, and I'm used to getting renters, well, that that house, that asset is generating quote sustainable income because I've got a product there that I can sell, and I and people are always going to need a house, and there's always going to be a rent roll for that house, and, and I don't have to do anything other than own the house, right? And so that's coming in or you know, renting a building. I mean, so, uh, you know, if, 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 so the bottom line is sustainable income is money that I, like if I sell a shirt, if I sell you a shirt and once the shirt is sold, it's gone. If I ask you to give, Hey, everybody pitch in and give me, you know, give the church a thousand dollars and you know, once I spend that thousand dollars, it's gone. Right. So imagine if you were to get a salary for life and somehow magically, you know, somebody said, hey, the government is giving you five thousand dollars a month for the rest of your life. Well, in a sense, that's sustainable because the government, as long as there's a government, they're going to send you a check for five thousand dollars a month, let's just say. So you could consider that sustainable. It's income that's going to continue to come in. And sure, you have to make some adjustments. If I rent a house, I'm going to have to spend a little money and fix the roof every now and then. But generally speaking, I can count on that asset from month to month, year to year to generate income. And that is sustainable. So the, that part is it's not just management, it's stewardship. And stewardship requires that level of sustainability and thinking, how do we leverage people, money, and facilities to generate sustainable income in addition to the tithes and offerings so that we can sustain our work long term and, and advance the kingdom of God? 
Yeah, I, I love this idea of leveraging assets. So let's talk specifics if we can here, because you talk about two two themes there of of as I hear it, multiple streams of income and then leveraging assets. So talk about some practical examples of how and maybe first this might be kind of a, a culture shock to some pastors and leaders, the idea of of assets, church having assets and leveraging them. So maybe maybe talk into that a little bit more and then give some practical examples of what it looks like to leverage assets to create income streams to do ministry. Uh, yeah. So let me give you a, um, take a step back if you're listening to this and have interest in this topic. What we're talking about, uh, and, and Lauren knows this because he's read Disruption and the book we're talking about, think about an American football team an American football team is actually a team of teams. There's actually three teams, offense, defense, special teams. The players that play the games are all different players. Like Tom Brady never plays defense, right? Yep, they, they're not on the field at the same time. They have their own coordinators. They have their own playbooks. They have their own metrics. You never ask the defense, hey, how, how, how many points did you score when they come off the field? They'd say, that's not our job. That's not what we do to help the team win. So it, if you think about it like that, uh, yeah, and these three teams are separate. They have separate metrics, but they have to play synergistically to win a big game. So you could have a great offensive performance, but if your defense can't stop the run, you don't win. Uh, or you could have a great offense and defensive game, but at the last three seconds, the field goal hits the upright, snap goes bad, you lose the game. So the point is to win big in American football, you have to have three teams functioning at a high level synergistically and minimizing mistakes or you don't win. Think about, let's use that analogy for the American church. We have a one-dimensional game. Yeah. Let's call that the spiritual game. Uh, you know, we have an offense, but we don't have a defense and we don't have special teams. We have to build out a three-legged stool, if you will, to play and be effective in the 21st century. A spiritual team, a social team, a financial team. Now, what does that mean? The spiritual team is the church, of course. And the playbook is evangelism, baptism, discipleship, small groups, worship, all the things we do under the church— but the disruptive innovation is we're going to have to develop healthy multi-ethnic churches uh, to reach an increasingly diverse population. But the second leg we advocate is that church creating a separate nonprofit, a, not a specific nonprofit that focuses on one issue, but a, an umbrella or general nonprofit under which you can develop multiple programs under that nonprofit for a variety of reasons uh, and, and then the third leg, of course, is what we're talking about, leveraging assets to generate ROI, the financial leg, for-profit business income in a benevolent way that generates uh, you know, sustainable uh, uh, income. Now, if you think about it like that, let's call that spiritual, social, financial, just like we said, offense, defense, special teams. How does the church make money if we're talking about making or generating income? The church generates income through tithes and offerings. Then you, then you add to that the grants and donations that a nonprofit would qualify for, would be able to apply for at a local, state, or federal level. Uh, other churches will give your church money when you're doing social justice, compassionate, and mercy work because maybe they don't do that work, but they have a heart for it. Uh, in our case, we have the largest food distribution in Little Rock. Literally right now in our facility, there's people from that very large church in the suburbs that I used to uh, be a part of are down here packing the food boxes, the dry good boxes for Tuesday distribution next week. So churches send money, they send people to the nonprofit, but if it's under a church, they won't do that. Yeah. So you open up new doors and possibilities by creating this umbrella nonprofit that lives synergistically like two sisters in the same house to the church. And again, that generates income through local, state, federal grants, donations, et cetera, from other people, not just in terms of money, but resourcing people, resources. And then that third leg again, the financial leg, the for-profit side, that's where we're leveraging an asset like a building uh, and, and saying, could we rent this space Monday through Friday to generate some measure of income? Are, are there businesses that we could start? Instead of paying for janitorial work, what if we used our money to start a janitor company, put a few people to work, let them get contracts out there, take net profit, and that pays for janitor work in our church, and we recoup uh, money of tithes and offerings. What are things we can do, uh, uh, things that we're already doing uh, as a church that could be monetized? Maybe we're giving away free coffee. Maybe we have a very nice coffee station, but we just use it to give people free coffee. Well, what if we monetize that work so that we can sell some baked goods or whatever things that'll pay for the free coffee to people 
And then again, our tithes and offerings can be recouped to go more to direct ministry. So at the end of the day, that tithes and offerings plus grants and donations plus for-profit business income, you put all that together and that's how your church not only survives, but thrives financially in the future. So leveraging assets, and this is the idea of creating multiple streams of income by structuring the church like a football team and getting those three teams playing and those incomes coming uh, and helping you. Now, leveraging assets, again, build uh, people, uh, money, and facilities. People are not just um, people that are in your church, but it's also people they know. Yeah. Right? And what can what can they bring to the table uh, uh, it, it, to help in terms of both the nonprofit and the for-profit? Um, for instance, I tell pastors, let's just use the simple coffee shop illustration. If you're a pastor, you don't have to be thinking like this. You weren't trained to think about it. That's probably not why you got in ministry to run a coffee shop. But again, you got people in, that are business people around you. Potentially, you prayerfully find your way to them and say, look, I got $3,000 a year walking out my front door in the form of coffee. If I give you this space and on behalf of the church, do you think you could monetize that so that we could at least generate $3,000 a month to pay for the free coffee, I'll have $3,000 a month for VBS in the summer, and if you can make a profit for yourself, fine. So we have connections and, and people. We've got to leverage that, those, those, those assets. Business leaders uh, and, and strong leadership in American churches today are sick and tired of being the employees in a company owned by the pastor. Mm. So in other words, let's say you got some business person and they got a little shop, they got five employees, they're running a successful little micro business. And, and you say to that person, hey, can you uh, pass out bulletins? You just made that entrepreneur an employee in your company. Or you might say to them, hey, we've got this thing called first impressions. Can you kind of put all that together? I know you have a business. You think you can help us figure out how to better make a better impression on first time guests uh, with all these moving parts. You just made that person a manager. But if I say to you, I got a coffee shop losing 3000 a year, here's the equipment. You think you can turn that around and generate an, a profitable income that will bless you, the community, and the church? Those people lean in. They, are, they want to be owners. They want to be owners. They don't want to be an employee and a, business, and a manager. Free them up to be an owner. That's how you can use people. Money, like we're talking about, it's not just money we, we might have or, or don't have in the bank. But again, a collective church can aggregate money. I just mentioned in two churches that I lead, we leveraged the money in that church uh, and, and collectively made an ask of the collective congregation and very quickly, within a few weeks, in both those instances, generated two hundred and fifty dollars to $300,000. Now, imagine if I'm a business person and I got to go out and try to get investors to give me two hundred dollars to 300000 How long would that take? This, too, is an asset because we not only have the people, but then they have money and when we pool our resources, we can quickly aggregate money. That's an asset a church has. Uh, and then again, the facilities, facilities to rent, um, you know, spaces that you're using and, and that are otherwise sitting empty. We can turn that into profitable income, bless the community, uh, and we can do that in a timely way. I'll just tell you, one of the churches I'm leading right now uh, uh, in Columbia, Missouri, when I got there, we talked about patients bleeding out in the emergency room. That's what I was hired to come in and help this church with. Last April... That church, and for the first three quarters of last year, that church uh, had lost its lead pastor. But in part, uh, the reason he was gone is because of the financial upside down, you know, things that were happening. But just on the money part of that church, uh, eight months ago, that church was, uh, and for the first three quarters of last year, it lost $35,000 on average a month. Wow. On average a month. That's over, you can do the math, how much money that is over nine, nine ten months. We've cut that now to 10000 a month, and we're on our way to more. Um, leveraging uh, by, by cutting fixed expenses without losing staff and also by generating income. So here's this 10-acre property with two gyms down to like 250 people. But literally this month, a few weeks ago, we – well, let me t back up. Prior to me coming, this church, every now and then somebody might rent the gym or something, and they were generating – on an annual basis, less than $10,000 a month, I'm sorry, less than $10,000 a year uh, for people just renting space. And they had plenty of space. This church used to be 2,500 people. So imagine how much space they have, two gyms, student center. Okay. They're getting less than 1000 a month. Their mortgage is 19000 a month. 
So if you think about the income, how much money are we generating from leveraging the asset of this facility against our mortgage? $10,000 is less than 5% of $19,000. So eight months ago, the church, in terms of leveraging that asset, was making was generating less than 5% towards its mortgage. In the fall, we moved into an area that was not otherwise being used, an uh, 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 organization in that city that now pays the church $2,000 a month. Okay, And then just this month, we took 50% of the existing classrooms that were not doing anything and rented that to a local school that is a startup school um, that's a nonprofit school working with at-risk kids. And they started with 16 kids. And that's, that, that school started for six months paying $1,200 a month. And by July, they'll be paying $3,000 a month. Wow. Now, if you're tracking with me, folks, here's what that means. Eight, nine months ago, this church is burning $35,000 a month. They got a couple hundred thousand in the bank. If nothing changes, they're going to be dead in 18 months. Okay? We've taken that church from, say, 5% towards the 19000 to today 22%, and by the summer, we'll be at about 33%. In other words, 33% of the mortgage is being generated by leveraging the asset. In our case in Little Rock, Prior to the pandemic, and by March, we'll be back to this level by renting space here to good business and nonprofits that are blessing the community. By March or April this year, we'll be back to generating $12,000 a month on our property against a $16,000 note. So if you're listening, folks, what, what I always tell people, especially if you have a facility, um, many people have a facility and they have a mortgage. That becomes your goal. How could we leverage our asset, the facility, uh, and or uh, monetize things we're already doing and or start businesses to, to, to make the mortgage payment? Because then you can look your people in the eye and say, not one penny of your tithes and offerings given as unto the Lord and for the Lord's work is going to bricks and mortar. And you can say that to them because we are practicing good stewardship. Let me ask this, and we can take a break after this question, but I'm curious, thinking about one of my passions is new church, thinking about uh, new church and buildings, buildings are one of the biggest assets for a church to use, at least as, as I've heard you. What would you advise a new church getting started? Like, Would you advise them to get into a space that they can leverage for, for income? What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, and again, I was there. It took us 12 years to purchase our own building, so I totally understand all this. Um, uh, there, there's When you're starting a church, obviously you don't typically have money, you don't have assets, you don't have a building, okay? That is not, though, a limiting, that does not have to be a limiting factor related to what we're talking about. Um, when we had nothing, there was a shopping center in the area that we wanted to be, it was for sale. I didn't know it at the time because I was looking at a 17,000 square foot abandoned bowling alley. Mm. I wanted to somehow, I inquired about the bowling alley. I just knew God would give us the bowling alley. I inquired about the bowling alley, found out it was attached to the entire shopping center. So they said, you can't just buy the bowling alley, which of course I had no asset at the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, or, or money to buy the bowl, but I just wanted I you know I thought we could let if we could get a number maybe we could chase that somehow. So I found it's attached to the bowl, the, the whole center. They, they said how much you want for it for the center? You have to buy the whole center, and they wanted four million dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, of course we we're brand new. We weren't even a church, sixty people, whatever. So I went to two businessmen in the city that I knew. I told them the situation, and one year later they offered four million dollars on that property. They were going to buy the shopping center. It would float through the rent roll, so they would it would be profitable to them. And then they were going to cut off the bowling alley and give it to me. Wow. Okay. It took a year to put that deal together. By then, the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, which is in our community, showed interest in the property. And then the price changed to $6 million. <laughs> So my guys pulled out, and the university bought it for five and a quarter. Now, and, I, and with that deal fell through, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but 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 even though it didn't work for me, it doesn't mean it couldn't work for you. Yeah. So let think about if there's a little five little little strip mall of five little stores. Maybe, and of course we're always advocating going to under resourced and abandoned properties. But maybe you could network your way to people that would buy that and allow you to operate for free 
and someday buy the center or buy it for you, or you could buy the center yourself with good business and partner with somebody to that that the rent rolls from four shops pay for the whole thing, and that's how you can get a building and you didn't even spend any money for it. My wife and I, four years ago, we bought a house on a lake here in central Arkansas, uh, and we went to the bank because we bought it when it was, a, you know, it was, it was people were living in it, but it was like basically 20th century. It needed, you know, tons of work. My wife's like an interior designer. She's like, you know, don't look at the house. Just look at the look at the view. Yeah. Well, we went to the bank and we showed them, here's the price we can get it for. And and if you will loan us X amount of dollars, we will. Here's what we're going to do in terms of renovation. And when we get done the house is going to be worth this. So we bought the house for roughly 295,000. Today it's worth almost a half a million. And the point is when we proposed to the bank to do this, they saw the econ- the economics in it and they gave us the loan to buy the house and the money to renovate the house because uh, with and we didn't put a penny down. We didn't put a penny of our own money down. We borrowed the down payment, we borrowed the uh, the uh the you know, the money to 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 renovate the house. Because when we got done with that renovation, there was more than 20% equity in the house. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, again, I'm probably explaining things that it's taken a lifetime to learn. And Lauren's got an MBA. He can teach us all. And you may not understand any of this if you're listening. But my point is, pastors and church planners, don't be limited. Don't go with the mindset of scarcity because where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. And by partnering with people, you can do it right there in Denver where you're at, Lauren. There's a, a, a EFCA church uh, or a Wesleyan, I'm sorry, a Wesleyan church downtown Denver that partnered. They couldn't afford a building. There was a nonprofit. They couldn't afford a building, Christian faith-based nonprofit. So they pooled their resources. They bought a building downtown and they share the space. So there are many ways to get this done. And the thing is, but don't give into a mindset of scary. Well, if we only had money, we could buy this building. Yeah, I, I, I think that's so important. So let's take a quick break. We'll come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with Mark Demaz. And uh, thanks so much for your time, Mark. Uh, you can take these closing questions as seriously or not as you'd like to. Uh, but if you're Pope for a day, what do you want to do? What's that day look like? That kind of thing. Yeah, you know, that's funny. I typically don't say Pope, Lauren. I say if I was king for a day, and I'm particularly thinking about the United States. Yeah. But if I was king for a day, I would demand, I would make, I would force every church in America to do CQ assessment and training. It's called cultural assessment, Mm. CQ, cross-cultural assessment and training uh, as offered by the Mosaics Global Network at mosaics.info. I won't give you, quote unquote, the sales pitch for it. But the point is, we can't just keep guessing and chasing random remedies in light of the cultural, the political, the the, the racial, political, social upheaval, the angst of our time. Churches are just guessing at what to do, and and they're 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 just chasing one random remedy or or, or another. They don't really know, if you will, where, what is right and or wrong. What are the possibilities, opportunities for their own body? In other words, before a doctor writes you a prescription. They they check you out. You get a physical. You you do an MRI and you find out, you know, you, you find out exactly where your body is at, and then on the back end, doctors can treat that with specific remedy and prescription. CQ assessment and training is a way for churches and organizations to, in a sense, go into the MRI tube as a collective body, go into this MRI tube that measures your cross cultural intelligence. What is your motivation to engage diverse people? What is your knowledge of diverse people? What are your strategies in action? Are they effective? Are they not? Uh, Do you think more individualistically than collectively, et cetera? So this 15 to 20 minute assessment taken by individuals on a staff or team, leadership team, gets aggregated into a group report. We do the theological and, and, and practical training off that to pull you out of the MRI, read the report as doctors, go over the report, if you will, with the body, and then write prescriptions so you can improve your cross-cultural intelligence to better advance the gospel in a credible way in an increasingly diverse society. So again, I say it all the time, if I was king for a day, I would make every American church, uh, every church in America, and every faith-based nonprofit go through CQ assessment and training. 
well, how about this? Since you're not king for today, this is only imagination. Uh, for practically speaking, let's get a discount code for our future Christian listeners so they can get a discount on the CQ assessment. We're going to use yeah. a big strategy here on live on the podcast. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's all right. Uh, what I would say to that is if you are listening and you're interested for your church organization in doing that, I just say hit hit me up. It's real easy on our website at mosaics.info, M-O-S-A-I-X.info. There's a button on there. It says, uh, you know, have a conversation or something like that. And uh, that'll take you to my colleague who will eventually get to me. And then when we chat about these things, you'll just say, hey, I heard you on the uh, on, on Lauren's podcast, right? You've got a name for the podcast. I, it slips me. The Future Church, I think, right? Future yeah. Christian. And then we'll, uh, we'll give you some measure of discount uh, towards uh, the cost of CQ assessment and training. I'll work if we can see if we can get a, uh, a link in the show notes after the fact here. Um, okay. A theologian or historical Christian figure you'd want to meet or bring back to life? Yeah, the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul, the Gospel of Paul, Romans 16, 25, Colossians 1, Ephesians 3, is Gentile inclusion and an otherwise, or what would have been an otherwise all Jewish church, salvation and kingdom of God. Uh, I feel like I, over 25 years, have really gotten to know the Apostle Paul. I feel like I walk in his footsteps. I feel like I'm this little brother. I feel like I I, I understand him and I'd love to sit with him and and to, to you know, to compare notes, so to speak, of how he lived in the 21st 20, 20, uh, century uh, to advance these principles that today myself and many others like me are advancing in the 21st. Yeah, that's great. Um, what do you think history will remember from our current time and place? Wow. There's, uh, yeah. I hate the, yeah. Who, I mean, yeah, you're going to have everything from the hundred year pandemic, of course, to Christian nationalism in January 6th, and you're going to have, you know, obviously all of that. But what I hope that history will remember is there were Christ-centered people and churches who were faithfully pursuing a church for all people, not just some people. And when church history looks back on the 21st century, that it will be the era of the rise and effectiveness of healthy multi-ethnic churches. Uh, That's a historical question. As you know, you look back in epochs of time, at the end of the day, they're summed up in one word. You think third century, you think, uh, you know, Const- Constantine and mm-hmm. essentially the, the, you know, Roman church, the government, if you will, take over the church or the enmeshment of it. You think, you know, the Reformation in the 15th, 16th century. I mean, the entire hundred years is summed up in a word, Reformation. Yeah. You know, so if I think about it in terms of church history, let's say God tarries and 500 years goes by, what will they say about this century? I firmly believe this. Uh, it, it is the century of the multi-ethnic church. This is when churches around the world, because of diverse populations for the credibility of the gospel, are are being forged into healthy multi-ethnic communities, figuring out how to do it. And uh, I think that's what will this century, that's my hope it'll be remembered for. Yeah, I love that. Um, it sounds like that's your hope then. Would you say that's your hope for the future of Christianity, more multi-ethnic churches living out the gospel? Uh, yeah, for sure. At the collective level, of course, uh, you know, I think at, at the personal or individual level, you know, it's really this ongoing, you know, search for, if you will, pure Christ- Christianity, the, the the essence of the gospel, love God, love your neighbor, walking that out uh, in increasingly complex challenges to our times and culture. I mean, you can talk about it from uh, LGBTQ uh, related to to that, and with with people coming out of the closet as they have, so to speak, over the last fifty years, and the church now having to wrestle with that, get much deeper in terms of understanding uh, uh, on on that. Uh, uh, you know, I, it's not an issue. I understand that, but just on the complexities of that, where does the church? We're having to wrestle and go way deeper than we ever had in a positive way. I think that's a good thing. It's Culture doesn't inform the church, but culture is always forcing the church to think more deeply about subjects it might otherwise ignore, not want to deal with, etc. So, and that's just one of these critical concerns in our time. But I'm looking ahead even to things like AI. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's coming down the road is you're going to have robots in houses that are going to want to get baptized. <laughs> you're going to have, uh, you know, they're going to, you're going to have a seven year old girl, you know, talking to her mom, why can't, you know, Anita come to church with us? And, and then what do you mean Anita doesn't have a soul and, and you know, and things like that. So, and, and there's so much complexities. You're not going to need a church. It's all going to be in the metaverse, right? Um, 
Yeah, you know, uh, you don't need you, your staff teams are cutting a half and a third because you got robots on staff, you know, that can they look like Martin Luther. They speak like Martin Luther. They preach like Martin. They counsel like Martin Luther, you know, or whatever. And they're going to be on staff. So the complexities that are coming with AI are just off the chain. Like we it's like no eye can conceive or imagine, I suppose, what's coming in the next 50 to 100 years. Uh, again, should the Lord tarry. So uh, the, at a personal level, we're going to have to wrestle with all that, think deeper, and and engage uh, more effectively than I would say the average Christian is doing now, uh, and and move away from nationalism and the enmeshment of Christianity with the American church, or with, with, a, with the United States. But that at the collective level, yes, churches are going to have to become collectively healthy, multi-ethnic, and economically diverse, socially just, culturally intelligent and financially sustainable through the wing in the ways we're talking about, or you're just not going to survive. And, or if you do survive, you're going to be marginalized and not effective at reaching diverse people and people that don't know Jesus. If you're not those things. Well, you're talking about AI reminds me of a conversation I had on the pod with a pastor in Florida in Miami, Chris Benick. Um, yeah. He's doing a lot. A oh, okay. Yeah. You know him. Yeah. He's doing yeah, a lot wrote, with buildings. Wrote, uh, yeah, he wrote the uh, afterword in my book on economics. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, give your websites where people can find out more about you, Connect. Yeah, uh, easiest way to get a hold of me and find out what's going on is our network website. Again, I've mentioned it already, mosaics.info, M like Mary, O, S like Sam, A, I, X like X-ray dot info. And by the way, we have a national conference November 8th through 10th in Dallas in 2022, uh, we do that conference every three years. This will be our fifth event since 2010. Uh, and all the information and tickets, sponsorship, it all goes live. It's all live right now. We'll be announcing it next week as far as opening the doors for ticket sales. But again, November 8th through 10th, the entire network and our family comes together in 2019. That was about 1,300 people, uh, 112 speakers, 50 sponsors. It's, it's a big event every three years, and your listeners are certainly invited. Great. Well, Mark, thanks so much for your time. Uh, appreciate the conversation. May God's peace be with you. You bet, Lauren. Thanks for having me today. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go. Do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romaglevitt. Thanks, and go in peace. Peace.